Well, it's, it's, uh, it's great to have you all on again this evening as we're now in our penultimate um, session, actually, of this, of this Sunday evening series, um, Real Work, True Worship. And this evening, we're going to be specifically considering um, how we're to respond as Christians when work is weary. Um, I've, I, I've um, suggested a resource to you in the past. Let me mention it again. Tim, Tim Keller's book, um, every Good Endeavour has been really helpful. In fact, some of the things that I'm going to be sharing a little bit later this evening, you'll see in, in the pages of that book as well. It's been tremendously helpful to me over the last few years, as I've had varying opportunities to consider again what it really means to be Christians at work, not just in the workplace, uh, but also in all of the labours that we put our hands to. It may be in retirement or studying as a student. It may be labour with a family context or a community or in paid employment. But I want to start this evening by um, a brief word of prayer and then I'm going to ask Charlotte Jewell and then Pete Brown to come and join me here in just a moment. So let's pray as we begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that we are able to work because we have been made in your image. You are the God who works the God who creates, the God who sustains all that he has created and makes it even more abundant and fruitful. What a privilege that we have that opportunity to work with you. And yet this evening, we want to also consider that in this world, at this time, our work will also be wearying. Help us to understand that, how to respond to it, and how to learn to worship you even in the midst of it. So lead us, help us, equip us to encourage others through what you teach us this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, Charlotte, I'm going to invite you to join me now on, on the screen here. Um, for for any, anyone who, who doesn't know what you already do, I know there'll be many friends here with us this evening, but just give us a flavour of what you're currently doing. And maybe tell us just a, a briefly about your family context as well. Um, well, I work in a nursery class in a primary school on the edge of the New Forest. It's a split site school, so the juniors are in one village and the infants are two and a half miles up the road in another village. The school has one class per year group, so it's a pretty small school. Mm. Uh, like any school, the days are very busy. I often have counted on my sports watch 15,000 steps a day. <laughs> I work alongside a teacher and we have each day 15 children aged between three and four. Most arrive at quarter to nine and they're picked up at three in the afternoon. I got into it by, um, yeah, what I maybe not call a coincidence. I trained as a ballet teacher, but when I had children, I've got two girls, the hours didn't fit well with our family life. I was working uh, weekends and evenings. And when my girls were at preschool, um, a very dear Christian lady who ran a lovely play group asked me to work for her. I'd always enjoyed teaching ballet to the very youngest children and have always been really interested in child development, particularly in the first five years of life. So I went on to complete my early years training and when we moved to Salisbury in 2013, a job became available at the school where I am now. And, and Sean, is it something you, you love? Do you enjoy doing that? Oh, well, I do love it. To work with children is a huge responsibility, but it's also an enormous privilege. Mm -hmm. I love each of the children in my care. And to be in a position where I can, through my actions and words, show each child they are so special to God and that he loves them is amazing. I pray every day as I'm driving through the new forest that God will help me see these children through his eyes. You know, some of the children really need the security coming to nursery brings. We've children from a variety of backgrounds 
And some children come from homes that are extremely busy and chaotic. And I just feel we provide a safe, happy place where they know they're secure. Charlotte, you know, it's lovely just hearing you share there. It's, um, it's really inspirational. Um, yeah. But as, as we all know uh, this evening, we're going to be thinking as well about some of those harder aspects of it too. And, and I'm, I'm going to look forward to hearing from you in that way as well. Not because um, we're wanting to cast a shadow over what you've just shared, but I think um, together we want to be real with one another about sometimes the, the darker side of work, the things that are really hard as well. I'm going to invite Pete Brown now to join us as well. Charlotte's going to stay on. Um, more questions for you, just as I said there in a moment. Hi, Pete. Hi, Mike. Um, tell us, tell us what you're doing at work at, at the moment. What do you do for anyone who doesn't know? Okay, um, I work in an office. I work in a small office. I work for a financial planning firm. Um, I've been there eight years now, which is the song second longest job I've ever had in my life. Um, it's uh, it's about twelve of us. Um, and uh, I don't deal with the clients. I deal with all the back of house stuff, whatever needs to be done. Um, I, they call me Sticky Pete because I glue everything together that is non-client work. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's... I've got I was going to say, Pete, I'm glad you clarified that because when you first said it, I thought you said stinky, Pete. But <laughs> when you then mentioned glue, it was clear. What you no, I think, I think they're, yeah, they're ha that joke has been played out a few times, Mike. But um, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, for those who, who, who've known me, I mean, I, I, I had a long career in the leisure industry, but it was interesting, a bit like Charlotte said then, that this opportunity came along. I didn't, I didn't sort of intend for it to happen, but I really felt looking back, that God had his hand upon it. Um, it was such a major change for me going into a small office environment. It was uh, with, a, with an old friend I was at university with 40 years ago. And um, it, it um, was a real contrast, but I believe that God has really taught me a lot over the last eight years. I was 54 when I started it. So I was really, it's a very difficult time in your 50s when you switch a role after you've had a whole career um, in one type of business because you go in from being the person who's the, the go-to person in terms of knowledge to suddenly not having a clue about anything and um, I did question many times what what is going on here um, but having been there eight years I think I know what God's role for me was within the company. Yeah, and, and, and we'll tease some of that out maybe in a minute, Pete. But, um, fill in a little bit of, of the story for us, because uh, you, you mentioned actually you'd been in quite a significant role before that, before eight years ago, and actually for quite some time in a very different kind of environment, different kind of industry. Yeah. Just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so so basically, for uh, you know, again, for those that know me, they know that I have a real passion for physical activity, seeing people uh, get into physical uh, activity and, and really... Um, improve health and that's always been my great my great passion so I went and did a PE degree in the early 1980s and um, started at Ferndown Sports Centre moved away for a number of years at different leisure centres but came back predominantly to Bournemouth when Little Down opened in 1988 uh, 89 and um, so really worked there and as we built the leisure industry in Bournemouth um, we ended up running um, five, six centres in Bournemouth, which which actually was my perfect role. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I was in my hometown. I was what I regarded was the best leisure facility in the country um, at Little Dan and then all the other sites as well. We had a big organisation and um, it was where I felt as though God wanted me to be. Uh, so, so I was really blessed. I really was in the right place. Saying to somebody once, if if I was told I would have to take a fifty percent drop in salary, I'd still do what I did, because it was absolutely right. Well, thanks, Pete. And um, as you've as you've alluded to there, there's been something for you in the transition between those two roles as well, which I know has not in some ways been easy. But you've also shared with me that that God's been at work teaching you many things through that as well. We'll come, we'll come to maybe that in just a moment. I want to. I want to come back and bring Charlotte in. As, as I've mentioned already, this evening um, is, is giving us an opportunity to think about 
um, the wearying nature of work and how it can be like that. Um, Charlotte, let me let me put it like this. What what things about your work can tempt you most of all to stay in bed in the morning? Yeah, um, I feel quite often that I am the lowest of the low <laughs> at work. You know, somebody said to me, oh, you're, you're the beginning of the food chain. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I really, really believe that. At, at times, I, it, it's so frustrating at times that I've been given a huge responsibility, but society doesn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is most visibly reflected in, in how low the pay is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, another thing that frustrates me sometimes is when I see all the good that we do in the daytime and then a parent or a carer or another adult in a child's life might say something and you know you can see through the eyes of the child everything coming crashing down and mm -hmm. and they're back to where we started at the beginning of the day you know I, I get very frustrated sometimes when I see the adults in these children's lives letting them down you know these early years are so important on so many levels mm. and and you can't go back and do it again you know I, I understand it's so hard being a parent I really understand and those early years are so tiring and demanding physically um, but I often try and say to people you know make the most of it don't wish it away mm. because it's gone like that mm. um, the other thing that, that I find really tough is, um, you know, just how we really need the good news of Christ mm -hmm. in our community, in our school. You know, I've just, I've just completed some safeguarding training at work. And, and part of this is looking at statistics um, concerning abuse and, and neglect of children. And um, the NSPCC report um, on, um, on this says that for every class of 30 children, six children would have suffered or be suffering some form of abuse. Mm. And um, I was sat on Friday doing this training and I just head in my hands, where do we start with this? Um, but you know, it's just amazing as a Christian, to know that God knows, God knows, uh, and we're not alone in this struggle. This isn't a battle that I, I'm fighting on my own. We're fighting on our own. God's with us. And that, um, you know, there is, as a Christian, a hope. We have a hope. And that one day, all this will end. Mm. Charlotte, thank you so much. And I, I, love, I love the fact that in so many ways, it's because this is just... Your, your natural heartbeat, you, you take that, that really challenging thing and you've already resolved it in the gospel. I praise God for that. And it's why, why it's, um, it's such a lovely privilege to have you part of our church family. <laughs> but just, just reflect with me just for a moment longer um, because you come across just so warm and so, <laughs> so positive about all of this. Are, are there times when it does get to you? When it just yeah. really grinds you down? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just um, not the children, not the children. I love, I love the children. And, and the reason I do the job is for the children. Mm -hmm. You know, when they come running up to you at the beginning of the day and wanted to show you something new, like a pair of socks that they're wearing. <laughs> it's just really <laughs> lovely. Uh, yeah, I just, I just find sometimes that, yeah, you're not thought very highly of mm -hmm. with, within your school, within your team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's and, and really that hard. And it is hard, isn't it? I remember tasting yeah. something of that. One of my earliest jobs was as a as um, a housekeeper in a hospital. And and if ever there's an environment where you really feel um, the, the 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 pyramidal structures, it's in it's in. Well, it was in in a hospital I was in certainly, and and I really really felt it um, that that people wouldn't even you know I'd been a lift with somebody wouldn't even look at me because I was wearing the the clothing that went with my with my role and my station. It, and it can get to you, can't it? It can be very wearying. That. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for being open and honest about that, Charlotte. Um, in a minute, we'll come back and 
and reflect a little bit on on the difference again that, that leaning on the Lord makes in those kind of contexts. We'll come back to that. But Pete, let me let me draw you in again. Um, for you, reflect on some of the wearying things for you. Either either maybe in 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 the work now or in the work that you were doing, or maybe even in the transition and the change. Just yeah, what are some of the been some of the really wearying stuff for you? I think I think <clears throat> the confidence when you get to the end of your career as you look back and you reflect on um, just how God's hand has been on all of it. That's through the good and the difficult times. I mean, there's, there are reasons behind it that are far greater than we can ever imagine. I think you have mm -hmm. to hold fast to that. Mm -hmm. um, we go through very different seasons, sometimes um, incredibly challenging, but, and, and it was for me in, in leisure, where mm -hmm. things were incredibly challenging, but it was no problem because you had a real passion for it and you got on with it. And we as a team achieved really some, some remarkable stuff. At other times, you look back and you think, I've been wading through treacle here. And uh, Genesis 3, 17, 18 mm -hmm. just comes to the fore about that we are in a fallen world and work is going to be difficult mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me um you know i i think one of the aspects that i that i found incredibly encouraging was the relational aspect of it you know that um uh when you when you've got relationship with people and you can make a difference like charlotte was just saying then with the kids there's an incredible fulfillment in serving there. Um, so when that all comes to an end, you know God's in it. And in fact, the transition that happened for me was that a Christian got in touch with me and said, Pete, with the timing, the act of ledger, which needed to happen to give us a, an interim within a role, the work wasn't there, but it but it was it got me out, and then, as I say, I joined um, Blue Sky. But it does make you you question why is this happening when things were so good, but then it also um, it, it teaches you to say, okay, I trust in you. Um, you know, Tom Tom Davenport on his last newsletter put in a wonderful quote when he said. God loves to be depended upon, so he gives uh, the imperfect, inadequate human beings impossible assignments. And that's just not the difficulty in the role. I think that's the difficulty in the transition of roles. So when you move into something new, the, the uncomfortable nature of that makes us grow hugely. Um, and I think that's very much the case for me, where I went, you know, I've been at Little Down for um, 14, uh, my second term was actually 15 years there. And I went into um, green recycling up at Eco at Turn Airport, where I worked with Freddie Smith, Freddie Smythe, who many of you know. Um, that was a transition and a half. Mm. But God taught us, and I knew that it was the right move for that time. But it's learning to trust totally and always still to serve in whatever we're doing. I mean, for, for you, Pete, can you maybe give us, uh, you've talked really helpfully there about, about the transition, and I'm glad because it isn't only just the day-to-day. -day. Sometimes it's the dislocating moves, isn't yep. it, that, that yep. can be just so very, very hard to work through, and I know I, I, I relate to that as well. Um, but, but for you, you know, in 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 the across those last eight years perhaps can you think of some days when it just really has felt that the, the work itself is wearing i know that for you and and as a family you've you've been through so many difficult things these these last years but um for the work itself have there been times when it's just been oh this this just is really frustrating or um yes you yeah, reflect on that <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean, uh, again, again, it was an absolute blessing to be at Blue Sky. I mean, I worked part time um, and I always worked part time. Actually, I went in four days a week and then reduced that to three days a week. Um, 
and also uh, Gary, the owner, uh, gives me incredible flexibility, which I desperately needed going through Kerry's illness. Mm. Um, uh, there was another role that came up that somebody said to me, you must apply for. We definitely want you as part of the team. And I went for it. First time I'd applied for a job in 30 years and I was turned down. And it was like, oh, okay, that's fine. And I was I was really sort of thrown by that because I wasn't quite sure why I'd been asked to apply for it, only to be turned down. Mm. But it was clear that that job would not, I would not have been able to manage it with Kerry's illness. So in doing what I'm doing now, I mean, the work is, it's very transactional. I just do the role. I try and serve others within the team. There's a lot of youngsters, a couple of uh, young directors, and it's great to be able to just feed in advice to them and encourage them and some of the other young members of the team. But it is about serving in all areas. Whatever I can do, I just do it. I water the plants. I make the tea. I do the board minutes. I feed into the management team as to the direction of uh, some of the vision that they have. I just, I'll just say, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, can I just say, Mike, I read, for those that know me, they love, they know I love my Tim Keller book on the Psalms. <laughs> this morning, um, it was a, it was a lovely piece, uh, Psalm 91, verse 15, which says, he will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. And Tim Keller writes, the esteem and worth we strive so hard to achieve and to get from others, um, he bestows on us. Mm. And I think whatever our roles are at work, whether it be completely subservient or not, he bestows the honour on us. Mm. We don't need that recognition from those around us as long as we know we're doing the best we can. Mm. We're serving him primarily and then we're serving everyone else. Mm. And that's that's the satisfaction in it. Yeah. Again, Pete, it's lovely, isn't it? I, I'm, I'm having to work quite hard to draw out of you those negative things because God is so clearly at work in you. It's fantastic. Mm. And, and, um, and I know, as, as you're sort of um, allowing us to see something of, that there are bits of this that are just really profoundly frustrating and... And, and they grind you you down. But your example of dependence on the Lord really, I know, has been a testimony to many who've, who've lived and worked alongside you. And it's lovely for us to hear that this evening. Uh, Charlotte, can I just ask you on that same vein, how, in a practical sense, how have you found yourself learning to lean on the Lord in some of these, some of these challenges? Well, some days <clears throat> I'm so exhausted I can only get through the day knowing God's with me and his strength is sufficient. Mm. And, you know, when, when things get me down, I remind myself that, you know, Jesus thought so highly of little children. You know, he uses a child to demonstrate how we should be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, he uses a child to demonstrate how we should be humble in our Christian witness. And and I guess what matters to me, like Pete said, is that I'm working for God's glory. You know, I I want to be good Mm. at my job, but I want to be successful in God's eyes, not not the world's. And and I'm just reminded of Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters and uh yeah that's something i try and remember (laughs) (laughs) and 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 it's lovely to hear that isn't it there's there's a difference between hearing and and sort of knowing the truth and actually daily applying it isn't there yeah yeah and and it's what's so lovely to hear from you in that regard pete is there anything more that you want to say in terms of your own daily experience of battling the, the the frustrating bits of working life i i just I think if I was maybe younger, maybe I would be, well, I would be different to, to how I feel about things now. Um, it, it, one thing, some of the things that I think I've really learned is whenever you're in a role that has status, 
it's very easy to say i'm a child i am a child of god that's where my identity is it's not in my work until that's taken away from you mm. i was introduced to giving a talk at lansdowne about six months after i left leisure and the person said to me this is pete who most of you know he used to work at little down but now i don't know what he does and i remember thinking yeah okay that's it you know pete was always the man at little down and now we're not quite sure what he does so it actually it it took away some of that identity and and i think in a working environment especially for for everyone really is to work really genuinely work on the fact that we are children of god and that is our identity and i think when you don't have identity with work because people say to me now what do you do and i say i work in an office it kills all the conversation there's nobody's interested at all so so that's fine then you can get on to the to the um to the serious things of life and it's actually quite a freedom when your identity is not in your work oh p that's a brilliant place for us to land this evening thank you so much and and charlotte it's great to have you um share with us as well and I know if there's anyone who, who wants to get in touch with you after this and follow it up, you'd be most welcome. I know you, um, you've got very open lives and hearts. Thank you for sharing with us this evening. Thanks ever so much. God bless you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, well, as we move um, on to think then this evening a little bit more about how God's word helps us to unpack this notion. Let's remember that what we've been seeing so far up to this point is that really work is a great privilege. It's just not, not something neutral. Um, we, we've been made as human beings in God's image to work in God's world, to take from it working with him and make it more fruitful, more abundant, to, to serve others in it to their blessing and all for his glory. And yet we have been reminded in, in various ways this evening, both through what Charlotte has shared and what Pete has too, that, that frequently it is wearying. Often work doesn't live up to our expectations of it. <laughs> it's frequently frustrating and sometimes even devastating. Well, why is this? Let's begin there. Why, why is work wearying? We need to go back to the beginning. And Pete um, did that for us glancingly just a moment ago. He mentioned Genesis Three, if you've got a Bible, we'll be looking at a few bits together this evening. Uh, but let me just read Genesis 3, verse 17. God says to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. In short then, work is wearying in this existence, our experience of life, because of sin and God's response to it. We've seen, haven't we, that in work, we are like gardeners, like God himself, working with him to bring more out of the raw materials that he's already given. It's how he worked in creation. It's how he works through us now. And it's how he will work in new creation. He's created us to see remarkable potential in all our labours. I was recently watching The Crown, um, where, where the, the young Prince Charles was, was showing his mother, the Queen, around the grounds of his newly acquired um, home at Highgrove. And he had such great dreams of what all the gardens around it would become. And this really is the promise that all work holds out. A patch of ground that could one day become a thriving city. Fields that could one day feed thousands. Sporting skills that, that could conquer new records. A tiny mould 
that could one day prevent disease for millions, a spark that could ignite an industrial revolution, raising living standards for billions, or, or a piece of wood that becomes a beautiful instrument, a balance sheet that could result in changed lives for many. Work promises so much, but the reality of our experience so often is this other side. Yes, from the ground, fruit would be born by Adam and his descendants, but through painful toil, jolly hard work. And of course, with the fruit would come thorns and thistles. Because of sin, because of the curse, our work will be hard and it will never yield its full potential. Uh, put like that, because of the fall, work became fruitless. I mean, there are times, aren't there, when, when everything goes wrong <laughs> in work, uh, but even when it all goes right, the results may still be disappointing. I mean, you may hope to make a real contribution to your organisation or, or the community or to others' lives. It's just that sin has a way of ruining it. Uh, back when I was um, at, at school, uh, leading the department, the science department there in a the secondary school, um, together we, we had this great idea to improve behaviour, uh, attention and engagement in science lessons. Uh, what, what we would seek to do as a department of 24 teachers together was, as it were, to create a culture within a culture within the school. In other words, when, when you were a student in a class, in science, whatever the teacher, you would know you were in that department because you would be held to the same high standards. Now, we, we, we worked together on this. We discussed it. We, we came up with some ideas. We threw out others and we pressed on. We made great gains, but it was nowhere near what we'd hoped. And, you know, in the end, after some months, even though there was, there was much that did come out of it that was good, do you know, even some of those who proposed new practices for us as teachers ending up, ended up resenting them and kicking against them. So was it, was it a poorly conceived idea? Well, not necessarily. Was it badly executed? Well, certainly improvements could have been made, but no, I think the real issue was that the ground always produces thorns and thistles, as well as fruit. There are seasons, of course, when our work is remarkably fruitful. But even then, sin and the curse ruin it in the end because nothing lasts, ultimately. Without God, work is not only fruitless, but ultimately meaningless. You may well know that the book of Ecclesiastes really is given to, to making this point um, over and over again. And this is God's wisdom for us to understand about life in this world. As, as the, the writer, the preacher there describes it as under the sun. That's where he says life is lived. And he observes it. He explores it in his great search for meaning. Can he find meaning in this life under the sun without reference to God? Uh, now, he looks for it in, in all kinds of places. And it would seem that he has all the resources at his disposal for doing so. He seeks it in wisdom. And certainly if this, if this is Solomon, then it is one that God blessed with peculiar wisdom. Can he find ultimate meaning there? Or he looks for it in pleasure itself or in riches and, and the abundance of, of what can be provided by the things that we might earn or receive. And he also looks for this meaning in work itself. Let me just read to you from chapter 2, Ecclesiastes 2, just a couple of verses, verse 17. He, he writes this, so I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun. Well, how, how when he'd achieved so much, if, if you read through it, you discover he'd achieved great projects. 
Why did he hate it so much? Well, he goes on. I stopped halfway through that 18th verse of chapter two. Listen, he explains why. He says, I hated all these things that I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they'll have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I've poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labour under the sun. Uh, My grandfather was passionate about his garden, a big plot around his bungalow. And that there was an orchard in the far corner. I was only very young when I, when I was toddling around in it. Um, there, there was a vegetable plot, I remember, over, over on, on another side, a lovely great lawn, and then many flower beds. He'd spent hours and hours and hours and hours on it. Well, not long after he died and left it, the whole plot was dug up, the house was flattened, and the whole thing replaced by an ugly retirement complex. Nothing lasts, no matter how much you put into it. I mean, look at life in this world as it is, like the the writer of Ecclesiastes has done. And this is the conclusion that you'll have to come to. Nothing lasts in the end. Have you felt it? I did when after just a few months of being uh, down here in Bournemouth, having moved from Lincoln. I got back in touch with uh, the school department that I'd left, having led just months before. And the person I'd appointed to to continue, I hoped, um, in in the the trajectory that we were going, after just a few weeks had left the school and the profession through stress. I mean, and it was a mess. Ultimately, you see, Our work does not last, and it cannot provide ultimate meaning. Yet sadly, still, we seek it. Ultimate meaning, I mean. And in so doing, we put our work in the place of God. Work moves from being worship to the thing we worship. And so work that has become fruitless and meaningless also becomes idolatrous, an idol, another God. Work that was given for the worship of God becomes something we worship as God. I mean, it becomes selfish. We start to view it as the way to meet my needs, to fulfil my desires. It's there for me. I certainly found that throughout my experience in education. We ask, what do I want to do with my life? Not what are the needs around me? I mean, how might God's world yield more blessings to his glory through me becomes how might I make more of this world for the glory of my own name? You see, when work is our meaning, it then becomes demanding, crushingly more so. The more we give this God, the more it asks of us. I mean, I don't mind telling you I love to work. I'm happiest when I'm busy, when I'm challenged, when I feel like I'm achieving something. It's it's kind of how, how God's wired me. But sadly, over the years, I've been shocked at how easily I've justified sacrificing my time, my energy, my health, my happiness, even at times, disappointingly, my marriage and my family for this God, this work. And as this happens, we find it harder and harder to sacrifice it for others and for other things. How easily our work stops us giving more time and energy and attention to those outside. How hard it is within work to rock the boat and and to love our colleagues ultimately with the gospel when it could cost us our jobs. And so work that has become demanding then becomes enslaving. We work hard to, to, to be fruitful and to find meaning 
We never get as much as we'd hoped for and anticipated. So we pour in more, we work harder, and we discover that this animal is never satisfied. It takes all we give it and still demands more. And at some point along the way, it became so important to us that we can't any longer risk giving it up, no matter how great the need outside. Work that was given for worship becomes the object of worship. As we've seen as a church in our, in our studies through Romans, this is actually very normal for the human heart. Let me just read to you um, from Romans 1 verse 23, where, where Paul writes, of all human beings, we exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. We take an image made to look like something that itself was an image of the true beauty of the glory of God, and we worship that in its place. I mean, we do that in our work. Just think with me for a moment what, what this ongoing exchange that Paul's describing in this verse, this idolatry is really like. A friend of mine recently, very proudly, took me into his home and showed me he commissioned some art pieces for, for the living room wall. I mean, he's so delighted with them. Imagine then, if you will, that a seriously well-known artist has chosen to, to, to approach you and offer their works for your lounge room wall. I mean, there's Monet at the door now. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> Here it is. It's for you. Now, he leaves, and there you are looking at this great masterpiece. You're about to hang it when, when you decide, oh, do you know what? I'm going to whip my phone out and take a picture of it. <laughs> How often we do that, don't we, with great vistas? And then having taken a picture of it, you, you, start, you start to be more enamoured with, 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 with the, the angle that you've taken on your phone. And you decide in the end, I, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll leave the, the, the money in, in, in the back room for the moment and I'll, I'll print this off and I'll stick it on the wall in its place. Only the, the trouble is, of course, your, your printer's out of colour, so it comes out black and white and it's a bit smudged. But, but there it is. And you stick it on the wall. And when Monet next knocks on the door, you can't wait to tell him what you've done to improve his creation. Look, look, look what I've done. We do this when we worship any idol in place of God. Do you know, we do this every time we look to our work for identity, as Pete was saying, or for ultimate meaning. We try to make God stand and watch and hope he'll be impressed with what we've done. He should be so offended, so disappointed, so angry. And the Bible tells us he is. Yet, most remarkably of all, he planned from the very beginning to quench that anger in his son, at the cross, so that our offence could be forgiven and cleansed, and in its place, in your life and mine, through faith in Christ, we could be given a glory so magnificent that it would be the glory of the Son himself transferred onto our lives like clothing, so that once again we can become a delight to God himself and bring him glory. Isn't that what Paul is talking about? When in Romans chapter 8, a little bit later on, he talks about the application of this glorious gospel to your life and mine from the beginning to the end, when in chapter 8, verse 30, he says this, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified. In other words, declared righteous, took our sin, the offence of our idolatry, laid it on his son, took his son's beauty and the perfection of his glory and laid it on us and declared us righteous like him. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, with Christ clothing us, 
We can worship God. We can delight him. We can bring glory to his name. And we can do it in the very work that once had so offended him when we had allowed that work to take his place. And that really is what brings us on. And back to where we began this series in Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, says Paul, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, and get this, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do you get this? Through faith in Christ and through his sacrifice, the idol of your work and mine is smashed. And that same work can now become the means of worship. Worship that delights in God and worship that delights God. And do you know what the most remarkable thing is? As that idolatry is removed and replaced again with true and proper worship of God through faith in Christ, then our fruitless work can become fruitful. It really can. Even, I would argue, it can become most fruitful at times when outwardly it feels like there are thorns and thistles everywhere. Why? Because God is more glorified in your life the more heavily you lean on him. The more heavily we come to him, the more often we trust in him. And isn't it in the the disappointments, the disillusionments, the, the discouragements that we do this most of all? And the more we come in those times, the more we discover that he is infinitely greater value than anything we were looking for in the work or a success in it or from it. We can fail and be more fruitful than ever. And the more we invest in him through these wearying things, the more we trust him, the more we become like him. And as you and I become more and more conformed to the likeness of his son, the more fruitful we are with fruit that really matters. But but what, what does this really mean in practice? Well, it means you can look at any area of work at all, and maybe in your mind's eye now, whatever the labors are for you in this coming week, whether anyone will recognize them or not, Fix your attention on just one of those things. What any area of work, look at it now and see the goal beyond it. That goal that through it, you would bring glory to God. And as you remember that, you recognize there's only one way you'll ever bring glory to God through that work. It's by trusting in the God glorifying work of Christ as he would be formed in you through those very things, whether you succeed or fail. And so you step out each moment, each day, each week, each season, each new job, trusting Christ to bring God glory through your labours, however it goes. Uh, One of the most wearying parts of work for me I think in school was all the many times I felt I was being measured. Maybe you can relate to that in your line of work. Uh, As teachers, we were constantly observed. As those with any leadership responsibility within school, it wasn't only your own class teaching results, but it was the teaching, it was the results of all the students in the different year groups. Was everyone making progress? Uh, And not only was that ticking along, Out before you, and Mike, you have to give an account for how it's all gone. Mike, can you just go through that? You just you froze for about thirty seconds. Sorry. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll I'll take a step back. There I was, um, being measured in the classroom, being measured on the results of my own classes, and as a leader on the results. So 
wearying. I'm sorry, I think we've just lost you again, Mike. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Is it gone? Yeah. Okay. We might have to just pause there. We might have to stop. Um, can you can you hear me now? Can I have someone give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, we'll have one final go. <laughs> okay. Um, what I was learning, and I think we've heard that from Charlotte and Pete this evening as well, was that in the wearying things, if we see the goal ultimately to glorify Christ, uh, those things become fruitful. And because that fruit is a fruit that lasts eternally, meaningless work can become truly meaningful. We can worship God for who he is and what he's doing now in us and through us, as we've been seeing. And we can look ahead and trust him for all that lies beyond it. And God's word assures us that our troubles are never wasted. Let me just read to you from 2 Corinthians 4. Paul puts it like this. He, put, he says, verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Why? For our light and momentary troubles, and let's not forget, they weren't by any means light or momentary for Paul, but he can consider them light and momentary. Why? Because they are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. At the most wearying trials of our work never need be wasted. They're achieving something. The most mundane things become meaningful. The most frustrating situations, at the most challenging conflicts, when, when technology lets us down, when, when responsibilities become crushing, all of it, my dear brothers and sisters, can be meaningful. Why? Because according to God's word right here, through it, we can achieve something. We can achieve a glory that outweighs it all. You see, as we trust in Christ for the patience we need, the endurance that only he can give to persevere, the kindness to be like him in these difficult situations, the wisdom to navigate them and the grace for it all, he works in us and through us. And as he does that, God is glorified right now and will be glorified throughout eternity future, as these very moments will stand as everlasting motives in your life to show the universe and all God has created the magnificence of his grace and his kindness in you and through you. Fix your eyes on this joy, this eternal glory and you will endure just like Jesus, who according to Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him endured the cross. And then we're told in the very next verse, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. Why? So that you won't grow weary and lose heart. So I want to encourage especially when it is most weary, to fix our eyes not on what is seen, not only on the balance sheet or, or, or the effectiveness of our cleaning or the productivity of our team, but fix our eyes on what is unseen because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Uh, well, let me pray. And uh, having prayed, after I've said amen, I'm going to ask uh, Gaynor at that point just to stop the recording. And then maybe if one or two others would like to pray as well as we close. Gracious Father, how we thank you that you are so real and honest with us about that 
darker side of our experience of work in this world. Thank you, though, Lord Jesus, you experienced all of our weariness to set us free so that one day it will be gone altogether. And yet while it remains through our faith in you, Lord Jesus, which is given by you to us, we can discover the purpose in the midst of the pointlessness, the fruitfulness when there are so many thorns and thistles, true meaning when all feels lost. And there, Lord, discover what it is to worship you in all our work. Help us, Lord, to share this message with all our Christian brothers and sisters, to, 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 to encourage, to stir, to strengthen, to bless, so that you may take all the glory and all the more so as we step out to work for you in these coming days. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>